Good morning. That's what I get as a response? Oh, man. I'm going to go back to my room if this, that's, that's how we're doing things. All right, so we're going to be talking about Istio today. And you've been hearing all conference long about policy, of servability, security, and reliability. Most people don't have the ability to do any of that, actually, mainly because it's not as easy as most people say. So what I want you to do is really think about why we think about all these things, and, and Istio, the tool, why it's important for you. Now, one thing as an industry that we have to come to terms with is this one statement. I believe the majority of the people managing infrastructure just want to pass. There's only one requirement. It has to be built by them. <laughs> no one likes any off-the-shelf things. The famous last words of most people in tech, I'm going to roll my own. <laughs> and once you do that, you're setting yourself up for tragedy. Now, a lot of people have started to think about building their own paths, and most of the technology you've been hearing about the last couple of years, a lot of people are starting to adopt things like Docker. And you ask, why Docker? Why is Docker becoming the foundation of most platforms that people either buy or build? And the real reason most Docker is important for most people is because it's like the first time people decouple their application from the machine. All the hype around Docker, there's real benefits. And this idea that I can have an application that's self-contained is where the first stage of portability comes into play. And then once you start to have things in Docker, it makes it super easy to decide where you want to run that. But that does not solve all your problems. Anyone here think Docker solves all their problems? I have snake oil to sell you. Once you get to Docker, you start to think about the next step. And this is where most people start to examine these cluster management tools, like Kubernetes or Mesos. And the goal here is that when you adopt one of these platforms, they also decouple you from something. But this time, it's the infrastructure. So once your application is decoupled from the machine, usually the last mile is decoupling yourself from the underlying infrastructure, whether that's virtual machines, a cloud provider, your laptop. And Kubernetes gives you a new set of abstractions that allow you to kind of run that at scale anywhere that you want to. And people have been running Kubernetes for a couple of years now in production. So it's no longer this new thing that no one knows how to operate. And then those people have learned, over time, Kubernetes also has missing pieces. Now, it's a much better starting point to build a distributed systems or your own platform, all these APIs built in. But what's missing? So when you go out and ask people, what should I do to actually run my applications, whether it's microservices or monoliths, there are things that you have to do that we mentioned earlier on. And then they'll recommend products like this. Nginx will deal with things like application management and how you get traffic to your application. You have things like open tracing to give you some visibility on what's talking to what, where's your latency. And then you have things like Vault for secrets management. And all of these things have nice APIs, and Prometheus provides this nice adapter to be able to scrape metrics from each unique application in your stack. And then the last box most people aren't familiar with, that is this new project called Spiffy. And what Spiffy does is it solves the real challenge most people have. We're all attuned to sending secrets to our applications. Here's how you connect to the database. Here's how you connect to this other thing. But the truth is, we have no identity for any of those applications. We actually don't know what we're sending these things to. So things like Spiffy try to give identity to our applications no matter where they're running. So once you have all of this, you start to ask yourself, where does Istio fit into all of this? And just like Docker and Kubernetes, the goal is that Istio doesn't replace those things, but it integrates with them so that you don't have to. If you think about all of those tools, all the right things to do, I think we all are at a point where we've heard enough, we've read enough, we know that we should have observability. But how easy is it to actually do? Most people struggle, even if they only have one language to implement all of that in. Then someone shows up at the organization and is like, hey, we're doing Haskell now. You're like, but why? <laughs> There's almost no good answer to that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> But if you find yourself in that situation, now you've got to go find libraries that implement all that security, tracing, and everything. And this is where the challenge comes in. You usually can't do that across all the stacks. So what Istio does is tries to take a different approach. So what's the how around this? So the way Istio tries to attack this is by 
sitting in the middle of the traffic flow between the services. And this is where we start to say, maybe the network should be smart, because this is one place that we know everything has to come in and has to pass through in order for this to work. And once you sit in the data path, you can actually start to aggregate things like the telemetry data, and then you can actually enforce those policies. And I'm not just talking firewall rules here and security groups. Right? That stuff is very elementary. It has no concept of what the app is attempting to do. It's just on or off. We need a little bit more insight here. So I think the best way to really think about this is like, how does it get implemented? So in the Istio world, there's a control plane. And most of these systems have some form of a control plane where you can describe your intention. Now, this is where it starts to depart from traditional tools, not just command line driven, but you can actually, hey, this is my entire policy for my entire infrastructure. So Docker gives us a way to describe how our application should be built, how it runs at the low level kernel piece. Kubernetes gives us the same policy type for the entire infrastructure. That's everything underneath the application. And then what about all the stuff above the application and around it? This is what Istio does, the same model, but applied at the application layer in between the network to form this mesh. And then there's this other thing called back-end infrastructure. When you think about your logging and your metrics, this is what we consider your back-end application infrastructure. Someone has to manage that. And so all of those things are managed in Istio's world through the mixer by these adapters. We will never be able to abstract away all the ways to do tracing or all the ways to do logging. But what we can do is map the events that come out of our systems and map them in a way that these adapters can just do all the hard work of putting the data in the right place. And then the final piece is, how do you make sure that these policies are enforced? So we do it with the sidecar. So a lot of this is actually built to generate a config that we push down to each node. Now, once you have the config in place, the only way to really experience what Istio looks like is to see it in action. So we're going to do that now to get a look at how this thing actually operates. Now, the goal here is to use a real-world application so you can kind of know how this works. So I kind of written my own little small microservice setup and then deploy it from scratch and see how do we actually roll Istio into place and what, we do, what do we get when we do, OK? So let's switch to that. So the first thing we're going to look at here is I have this Kubernetes cluster. And it has a bunch of nodes in it. And again, the whole point of running Kubernetes, it doesn't matter where I'm running this. It could be my laptop. It could be a cloud provider or my own data center. And we're extracted away from that. And then we need to deploy our application. So the first thing we're going to do is just deploy this simple stack of our application. So here I'm just going to say kubectl apply dash f Kubernetes deployments. And then we have a couple of pieces. We have a backend service called bar. And then we have another backend service called foo. We have another one called front end. Right? So this is what most people are doing with Kubernetes. It makes it super easy to say, hey, this is how I want my stack deployed. And once it's deployed, we can get a little bit of information about what's running. So here I'm just going to get all the applications that are running at v1. Great, everything looks like it's running. So at this point, I should be able to hit it. So this is really straightforward. Um, I should be able to ping the application. And all it does is tell me, hey, you're talking to the front end. And you're getting v1 of each of the back ends, right? Pretty straightforward. I'll make it slightly bigger so we can see it. So the application works. Now the problem with this is most people get this far, and then they stop. So you go to your dashboard, you don't see anything. You got no metrics. You went to Best Buy, you bought all these flat screen monitors and hung them around the office. <laughs> People come to visit you, and you got that. <laughs> you guys are doing absolutely nothing. So you're flying blind. Now, this is the situation most people have, and they rely on some true tribal knowledge to debug. It's like, no, 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 you got to go to that server, the special server. And the person that can access that server is on vacation right now, so we got to wait. And we got to get out of that situation, so we want some visibility. Now, one thing we could do is ask all the developers to instrument their code in a way where we get metrics into the system. What's the chances of that happening? Yeah, you laugh. Close to zero. So we need a better way. So the way we could do this is to think about uh, this sidecar pattern. So without approval, we can go in and attach the functionality we want to the system. So let's try that now. So we'll say kubectl apply, the same thing. But this time, we're going to inject the sidecar. And now you can do this on the server side soon, but I'm just going to do it here so you can kind of see how it works. So istio CTO, kube inject dash f. And what this will do is inject the sidecar in the same manifest. So we don't want to touch the application. 
Don't want to really touch the deployment descriptor, but I do want to attach the sidecar to the process. So we'll do the front end. We'll also do the dependencies. And then we'll do both of them. So this should be foo, live demos. All right, so now everything is running. Let's look at what the state of the world is now. So at this point, version equals v1. So you notice here that it says two of two. So instead of one of one, we're just the application. Our sidecar is now running side by side with the application. So at this point, I can actually do this. I'm going to now communicate through this. I'm just going to put it in the watch loop so we can see what's going on here. So let's just throw this in the loop. And we'll start to see that we're depending on one of our sub-dependencies is v1 bar. Now, once we have this running, let's check out what we get for free. So without the developers doing anything, the sidecar sits in the data plane and can look and grab all of these metrics for the application. So not only is it just grabbing the metrics about how many requests per second, it understands things like HTTP, HTTP2, gRPC, even certain database connections. It can handle all the things like retry logic, exponential back off, all the things you should do to have your application be production ready, the sidecar will do for you automatically. Not only will it give us the metrics, but it will also give us things like tracing. So as these requests come in, how is it flowing through the system? We come here, and we can actually see some of the traces. So we see that our front end is talking to bar, and then it talks to foo. And we can see that it's doing it in a serial fashion. And maybe these should be done in parallel. Without visibility here, you will just be straight up guessing. So now we can actually see what's going on, all handled by the sidecar and not updating the application. The other things that you can do here is you can imagine a world where you're doing the whole DevOps thing, and your dev team gets to go and do all the deployments that they want. And they're always responsible, right? So there's never anything to worry about. Haha, <laughs> psych. Um, so what we're going to do is deploy a new version, just to kind of simulate what happens here. So we deploy v2. Now, normally in a Kubernetes deployment, when you do this side by side, given how my service is set up, traffic will go to v1 and v2. Now, once you inject the sidecars, you have some policy. The dev team's like, hey, I don't see v, v1. Well, the good news is I'm in full control now, regardless of what people do. It's invisible to them that I have this control. Now, if I wanted to show you what's actually going on here, I can actually delete one of the, the route rules that I have in place. So I'll delete this rule. And what you'll start to see is the v2 traffic start to show up. Okay? Now, that's not what I actually want. So I'll put my rule back in place. And when you look at this rule, it looks a lot like the way we describe our infrastructure to Kubernetes. We can just say, hey, anything destined for bar in a particular namespace, here's how I want that traffic handled. So I'm going to go ahead and put it back now. So I'll say istio control create dash f. And of course, you can automate all of these things. There's no need to actually have to do these things manually. So we'll put this back in place. And as soon as we put the policy back, all of our traffic starts to reflow. And we don't need any of the support in the underlying runtime. We don't have to coordinate with the networking team. We actually have full control of the API. Now, at this point, this is the perfect time to have a conversation. So we're going to try something. Now, the Istio API is really robust that you can actually rethink the way we interact with our infrastructure. So we're going to try something new. Right? So one thing we can do is we can actually start to talk to our infrastructure. Like one day in the future, it'll be like Star Trek. You'll be talking to your infrastructure, I promise you. Let's try it. OK, Google, talk to Istio. Sure, let's get the test version of Istio API. Hello, Kelsey. Hello. This is a pretty large crowd you have here. I hope you're fluent in the Istio commands. I noticed you're using conference Wi-Fi. The demo gods won't be too happy. <laughs> Get the front end topology. Got to actually turn the mic on. Get the front end topology. The front end service depends on service foo and service bar. This is not what I would consider web scale. It's more like cute. <laughs> So how is it able to get this information? So the nice thing about this stack is we do have an API that will tell us all of our dependencies based on the data that's flowing through the system. So here's the raw data that I'm using through my API, but I also have the ability to look at the graph. 
and you see this graph, and it will actually draw out all of my dependencies based on the traffic going through all the sidecars. We don't have to ask anyone to instrument anything. We just get it for free. Now, the other thing is you can exercise your power here. Say devs aren't quite listening to you. Deny access to the bar service. Access to the bar service is prohibited from the front end service. So what you do is you wait. And when you wait, you see the 400s and 500s spike. You gotta let them know who's boss. <laughs> Kelsey, the site is down. Like, I know, I did it. Right? So then you be responsible when you put it back. Allow access to the bar service. Access to the bar service is permitted from the front end service. So what should happen is we should see the 400s and the 500s drop. And it turns out they really need that V2 application. But the thing is, some patterns just don't make sense for all application types. When you're dealing with the new stack that we're dealing with, you're not just dealing with browsers. Sometimes you're dealing with mobile devices or even cars. And some of the updates that people are performing need to be strategically rolled out in a canary pattern. So ideally, you may say, hey, show the new application only to the mobile device. So what we're going to try to do is see if we can do that surgically. Now, this is something that's really hard to articulate in Kubernetes. There's no way to express this because that's not a concern of it. It deals with the underlying infrastructure. We need something at the application level that can do a slightly better job. So let's return back to our command line. And we see that we have our first app in the loop. But what we're going to do is change the next one. And we're going to set down here, let's make it a little bit bigger. We're going to tell curl to set the agent user string to mobile. And we're just going to run it here. So at this point, we have both applications, one sim uh, simulating a mobile device, the other a browser, and they both get to see v1. Now what we want to do is only allow traffic to the, v to the mobile devices. Route mobile traffic to bar v2. Route update complete. Traffic from mobile clients will be routed to bar version v2. Thank you. I gotta admit, that was pretty dope. <laughs> so that's Istio. I hope you check it out. Thank you. <laughs>